In the following video, we will be identifying the difference between analog and digital hog data, and how it is transferred through the network with a modem, the characteristics of wired and wireless communications, the different types of networks and how they're designed, and how to keep your personal data safe while online. On June 12, 2009, the United States Federal Communication Commission ceased all analog television transmissions forever, and now require all broadcasting signals to be digital. The 2.5% of the American public who relied on bunny ears to get their local channels now need additional equipment to access the same channels that are now being broadcast digitally. But what is analog data? Analog is a continuous form of data and is a physical representation of the information that it carries by measuring the amplitude and frequency of the wavelength. This image represents a 4 Hz signal as four complete cycles of the wave occur within one second interval. Sound is another form of analog data. When you listen to the radio, the sound of the radio DJ's voice is being reproduced through your radio speakers, recreating a nearly identical analog sound wave from his voice and allows you to listen to him as if you're in the same room by utilizing radio transmission. So how does the voice of a disc jockey go from the radio station studio to your personal radio? If you look at your radio, you may notice the FM dial only shows a range of 88 megahertz to 108 MHz. And your favorite radio station uses a narrow spectrum of this range, which you must tune your radio to if you want to listen to a particular station. But what does this number mean and how is it used to transmit music and information over the airwaves? In order to listen to the radio, there are two key components that are going to be needed, a transmitter and a receiver. As the radio announcer speaks into the microphone, a diaphragm inside the microphone vibrates. A transducer inside the microphone recognizes the vibrations and converts the sound energy into a low-powered electrical current, which is then sent to the transmitter, which modulates the electrical energy into the frequency of that particular station, where it is then transmitted. If your radio is tuned to that particular frequency, the signal is received and demodulated, converting it back to electrical energy, where it is then sent to your speakers, which vibrate identically as it was when it was captured by the radio announcer's microphone. The analog television broadcast that was terminated by the FCC on June 12, 2009 worked the same way, that not only transmitted audio, but video as well, and did so by modulating the analog signal that was written on the magnetic film commonly found on VHS and audio cassette tapes. And although analog television transmissions are a thing of the past, it is still possible to receive the new digital broadcast with the same analog radio waves that were once used. So what exactly is digital data? Digital data is a discontinuous form of data. While analog is a nearly identical representation of the information that it carries, digital data represents its information with a value using numbers, and instead of being measured, it is counted. Binary is one of the most common forms of digital data, using a base 2 system of 1s and zeros, ons and offs, or any other two distinguishing symbols. And although we associate binary to electronics and how they operate, binary can be used anywhere, such as sending a message miles away with a bright light using Morse code, or even counting up to 1,048,575 using all 20 of your fingers and toes, or digits. So how can digital data be sent through an analog radio wave? When analog data is modulated, it is encoded to a frequency that acts as a carrier. When the signal reaches its destination, the signal is demodulated, stripping the carrier frequency, leaving the information being sent to be accessed. Digital data can be encoded the same way. Do you remember this sound? This is a sound of digital data that has been modulated by a dial-up modem, which embeds the data to the carrier frequency needed to transmit through the phone line, where a modem on the receiving end demodulates the signal, allowing the digital data to be accessed by a remote computer. Telephone lines may be one of the most common forms of wired communication that use CAT3 station wire and was not only useful in connecting us to the internet, 
but was the primary medium used to communicate with one another before cell phones took over. However, dial-up internet was slow, with a maximum data transfer speed of 56 kilobytes per second. The telephone line used for voice and internet communication was theoretically capable of transferring data up to 10 megabytes per second. So why was dial-up so slow? Think of the internet as a road. A double lane highway can allow more cars to travel through a section of road than a single lane would, while an eight lane interstate can handle four times the amount of cars as a double lane highway. Dial-up, in a sense, was a three lane highway with two lanes closed for no reason. When you dialed up to your internet service provider, the connection used the narrow band frequency dedicated for voice communications to transmit data. The unused broadband channels available with CAT3 station wire were eventually utilized to create a high-speed, always-on connection directly to your internet service provider, creating a dedicated service line, or DSL. Coaxial wiring used for cable TV works roughly the same way as DSL. While cable television providers only use a portion of the total available bandwidth of the coaxial cable, the unoccupied channels can also be used for broadband data transfer, just like DSL and CAT3 cable. However, the broadband signal used with cable is shared with other users on the same network, whereas DSL sends only your data through the broadband channel of the telephone line that you subscribe to. Now, the latest and greatest way to gain access to a high-speed internet connection is through the use of fiber optics. By using a thin, flexible piece of glass or plastic wire, pulses of light can be sent through the wire, where sensors at both ends can recognize if the light is on or off registered as a binary signal. So what about wireless communications? Just how RF signals that broadcast TV and radio signals wirelessly, many other wireless forms of data transfer can be used. More than likely, you have a router in your home that is not only able to directly connect devices using the CAT5 Ethernet cable, but is also able to connect them wirelessly using the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers 802 standard protocol that transmit data wirelessly encoded on a frequency band of your router creating a wireless local area network. And just like Wi-Fi, many electronic devices can be connected or paired with one another, but not with the Wi-Fi protocol, but with the low-powered high-frequency Bluetooth protocol, which has a limited range and creates a personal area network for you and your personal devices, such as a wireless headphone or speakers. And most of us carry a cell phone in our pocket that are able to send and receive data with increasing speeds. Using the Global System for Mobile Communication Protocol, multiple devices are able to be connected to the service provider's network, creating a wide area network. And while these wireless protocols create different networking structures to connect us with one another on the internet, how our data is transferred can be done in multiple ways. A client-server network is widely used. As you type in a web address, the domain name is registered to the IP address of a server which then receives the request and sends back the information it was requested, or relays information to another computer, such as an email. Instead of using a server as a central hub of information, a peer-to-peer -peer network can also be used that is created by connecting individual computers directly to one another. So with millions of computers connected through the internet, how do you protect yourself? One thing you can do is have your firewall enabled on your home router. And if you don't have that enabled, you should probably turn it on right now. With the firewall enabled on your home network, only authorized information can be sent and received. And while you're in your router setting, make sure that your home wireless network is protected with a WPA key. An open network can allow anyone within range to access your personal devices connected to the network. While you're online, you may have peace of mind knowing that your computer's IP address is disguised as your personal device's IP address can not only reveal your physical location, but it is the exact address needed to access your connected devices remotely. Using a Tor browser or subscribing to a VPN service can disguise your IP address and help prevent potential cyber threats. So what did we learn? Now we know the difference between analog and digital data and how both are able to be transferred wirelessly using modulation and demodulations. We also learned the capabilities of wire communication mediums and how they're used for broadband data transfer, as well as the different type of wireless communications and the networks they create. 
and the different networking infrastructures that create a network of computers and how to keep yourself safe online.